Hello, and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. I'm Chuck Bombardier, a rehabilitation psychologist in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine here at the University of Washington, and I'm the director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury Model System here. Um, our, the forum and the video recordings and our online media content are made possible by a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research in the Department of Education. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, several speakers. First, we have three occupational therapists from Harborview Medical Center who are going to be talking about maximizing upper extremity or upper limb function. Amy Sisler, uh, Leslie Fox, and Beth Gardner. And after their presentations, we are also privileged to hear from two individuals with spinal cord injury um, who are going to describe um, uh, adaptive gadgets and methods that they have uh, learned to use to make their lives a little easier. Hi, everybody. So first of all, we'd like to thank um, the occupational therapists at Harborview Medical Center that sent all their ideas and pictures, um, SCI consumers who have shared their ideas and experiences. Teresa Foy from the Shepherd Center in Atlanta allowed us to use some of her pictures from presentations that she's done, and Gail Raymond also from Craig Hospital. Um, so why we wanted to talk about upper extremity um, function after tetraplegia, Besides having worked, or hearing from people that we work with directly, um, I reviewed a couple research studies and arm and hand function was reported to be the most debilitating and hard to deal with loss after cervical spinal cord injury. Arm and hand function was a top priority area for continued research and functional use of hands um, can increase independence and decrease caregiver need and even a little bit of hand function or just a small idea can make a huge difference in quality of life. Um, so the objectives for tonight are for people to understand compensatory techniques and options to increase independence with self-care, um, gain an understanding of frequently used treatment options. Um, we're going to give a summary of some of the current research and review options for exercise. And just a note before we kind of get into it, um, if people have a C4 complete injury, some of the compensatory techniques that we're going to talk about aren't going to be available because of the weakness in your arms. So the goals a lot of times for C4 complete injury patients are um, working with assistive technology and hiring caregivers. So I just wanted to give two resources um, for C4 complete injury people. And the first one is a phone and computer access presentation that's on the website. And then the second is a forum video for hiring caregivers. The options that we're going to be going over tonight are adaptive equipment and tools, splints, exercise, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, and surgical interventions. And Beth is going to kick us off with adaptive equipment and tools. Great. So as um, Amy mentioned, the portion of the presentation that I'm doing tonight will be on uh, adaptive equipment, uh, looking at different areas of day-to-day -day living and adaptive equipment or tools that may help people with tetraplegia to be more independent. I want to forewarn you that there's a lot of pictures, a lot of information and slides here tonight, and I think um, in an effort to make sure every, everyone has an opportunity to speak, I'm going to go through them pretty quickly and try to highlight um, pieces of equipment that maybe people may not have seen before that may be unfamiliar or new. Uh, but just please know that this information will be on the website, so if none of this is um, information that you've seen or products that you've seen before, it will be up on the website for future reference. So we're going to start off with um, everyone's favorite topic, eating and drinking. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what a universal cuff is, so I won't speak too much about that, but I did want to highlight this product on the right, which is uh, called a Dining with Dignity Utensils, that I've had a lot of feedback on from um, users who feel like it's um, a nice piece of equipment and uh, you know, something that's not so kind of medical looking. I also want to just mention too, if there's a product that I know the, the source for, I've tried to reference it in the slide, uh, and if not, then, you know, I would encourage you to look online for the name of the product, and a lot of the um, items are available on Amazon, and even at like Bed Bath & Beyond, and Target, and Home Depot, so forgot to mention that. 
Uh, another product that I haven't been, um, that I have, I'm not too familiar with, but uh, I think looks great is this product on the right. It's a built up handle for utensils, but it's also got, um, it's long and it's bendable. So it's really moldable for uh, any user's particular grip or um, functioning level. Options for cutting, uh, pizza or wheel can be useful for some people, I think especially if you're able to uh, build up the handle with some type of a moldable plastic, which I think Aditya is gonna talk about at the end of tonight's presentation. Also universal, um, excuse me, rocker knives, uh, either with upright handles or um, some clever therapist actually uh, put this rocker knife into a, um, almost like a splint or a strapping device uh, to keep it there in order to allow this user to, to cut food more easily. Hydration, so uh, probably the, the big uh, item here that I wanna highlight, and it's difficult to see in that slide on the left is the, the lock line, which is sort of a moldable tubular uh, uh, semi-rigid um, line or, or plastic that you can mold in any direction or shape and place anywhere you need. And uh, what this user has done has essentially just uh, attached a camelback tubing to the lock line and placed it up near uh, their mouth for easy access. Other options for uh, water bottles, if you're more a water bottle person, uh, that strap on the right I think is a nice uh, strap because it's got a non-slip surface um, attached to it. Uh, another nice option, so metal water bottle again with the lock line and uh, the tubing for the water bottle just inserted right in there. Some options for hot beverages. Um, moving on to grooming activities, so uh, built up handles or uh, strapping systems for making tea freshing a little bit easier. Um, some kind of clever ideas, the one on the left is basically a custom made uh, flosser. It's been built up with uh, splinting material, spl splinting material, or what we refer to as orthoplast, and then inserted into a universal cuff to make uh, flossing easier. And then an automatic toothpaste dispenser, which, um, strangely enough, when I was doing some research on it, found uh, that they're fairly inexpensive. So basically, just have to put a little bit of pressure on the back of the automatic toothpaste dispenser to dispense the toothpaste, and they range anywhere from five to forty dollars. Um, easy access, a picture of an easy access sink, and then a couple of pictures of uh, soap dispensers. One that's just a pump style soap dispenser, but pretty solid, pretty heavy. And then also one that's a, um, a hands-free or motion activated. And then also uh, learned that there are some adapters for regular faucets. Uh, they run about $50, they're battery op operated, and they can make a faucet um, no, you know, hands-free, basically motion activated. Uh, bathing options, not gonna spend too much time on that. Uh, these were uh, pretty new to me, just uh, slip-on style uh, brushes for hair and or body, just go over the finger. Um, I understand those are available at Walmart, and I think those are pretty slick. A Couple of other options for showering. Uh, this picture on the left was given to me by Nancy, and I understand that uh, particular shower head, and again, I apologize for the picture, I tried to blow it up. That uh, shower head has a uh, sort of an integrated U-cuff or universal cuff uh, on it, which makes it easy to handle. And that was, uh, I think, purchased at Home Depot. Uh, again, the infamous universal cuff. I uh, wanted to just highlight here that on the end of this uni universal cuff, there's a, a loop that makes it easy for putting on and off. Uh, they're also made with D-rings sometimes for the same purpose. Uh, hair styling, um, just wanted to highlight this picture on the left. This woman here has a lot of great YouTube videos and what she's done here is she's sort of made her own universal cuff by wrapping a um, large uh, hair band around one hand and then she works the comb uh, underneath that in order to style her hair. And I would encourage you to definitely check out some of her YouTube videos because she kind of, she covers the gamut in terms of day-to-day -day activities and creative ways that she's found to do things. Razors, again, another clever therapist discovered a way to make turning an electric razor on uh, more um, easy. So basically using a cabinet bumper on the on and off button and um, splinting material again to build it up to make uh, it easier to turn on and off and to reduce the amount of force that's needed to activate it. Uh, ear cleaning with a, um, a foam ball and a um, clear plastic straw, which doesn't show very uh, well in that picture, but it's holding the, the Q-tip rigid. 
a makeup station. So uh, for people that are really wanting to um, go all out with makeup, this is uh, quite the makeup station. Uh, pretty slick in that it's got all the makeup uh, Velcroed on or attached onto the permanent makeup station and then a uh, custom universal cuff for that mascara wand. Uh, eyeliner inside uh, what's called a wand chick writer, which is often used just for a regular pen for writing. So she's adapted it by using it for her eye makeup. Uh, using some type of a friction tape or coban wrap to increase the diameter of um, anything really, not just makeup, but anything, pens really. Um, and then also she used it here to extend the, the length of her makeup utensils. Not really a lot of equipment being used there. Um, moving on to clothing, um, I wanted to just uh, highlight uh, some of these websites which have some really nice options for clothing. Uh, most all of these websites here were developed by individuals that have had a spinal cord injury or some other type of injury um, and they were in need of and wanted more sort of fashionable clothing. And so there's some really nice options uh, on these websites that I'd encourage you to, to check out. Uh, thinking about dressing, uh, a couple of options for lower body dressing. One is a commercially available, um, it's basically a, a push dial cuff used for uh, pushing your wheelchair that has a non-slip surface on the center. Can be used to help with pulling pants up. Um, that non-slip surface can really kind of help give a little bit more purchase or grip while doing that. And then again, another clever therapist, wish I could say it was me, but it wasn't, uh, made a custom splint with sort of a, a hook um, at the end of it that sort of acts as a finger to help hook the pants in pulling them up. Uh, zipper pulls, uh, again, not a great picture. You can use a key ring, really you can use anything there um, that in that picture on the left. And then on the bottom right, there's something called a pocket dresser, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, I liked this particular one because it has a uh, universal cuff attached to it at the top. And it's more versatile than what, you know, a traditional uh, button hook or zipper pull because there's all sorts of different attachments. So it's, um, you're able to use it for more types of clothing. Magnetic options. Um, these are the Endless Ability jeans, which have some really nice features. They have a higher back and a lower front. They've got pockets, which are, are lower um, for easier access. They've got a, um, a zip on the inseam for uh, self-cathing. So, and they're not super expensive, so really nice. Belt loops, or excuse me, um, dressing loops. Uh, so basically a loop on the inside of the pant with a webbing strap inside for pulling on to help pull uh, pants up. Uh, these were courtesy of Adita. So basically taking, um, he took some shoes to a cobbler and had the backs removed and then had a neoprene strap uh, put around instead and it's uh, secured on the other end with a piece of heavy duty Velcro. Moving on to bowel and bladder, uh, won't spend maybe a lot of time here, um, but we'll just encourage people to work with their rehab team, both their occupational therapist and their physiatrist, and then of course your rehab nurse, um, if this is an area where you're looking to increase independence. Um, in terms of cathing, there's some great options here. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that option on the right. Basically it's used to help stabilize the penis to help uh, with cathing more easily. And then on the bottom are a couple of custom catheter, uh, catheter holders made with splinting material. I think we have one here tonight. One is just a built up uh, utensil or handle. Uh, and the one on the right is a universal cuff, basically uh, made out of the same splinting material. And then at the end, it's just a barrette, which you really don't need a lot of pressure to open and close. Uh, so pretty low cost, very effective tool. Uh, some strapping hook and strap systems for keeping your clothing out of the way in order to perform your uh, cathing program. I've seen people use bungee cords as well. Another example, uh, somebody that uh, basically um, just adapted a Gatorade bottle uh, and using a universal cuff and then a pull tab loop for external catheters. Uh, this is an individual who um, wanted to be able to uh, use her, her uh, urinal, but didn't want it in kind of in plain sight. It's a large urinal. She basically found a ice climber's bag to store it in. So that's really why I put that slide in there. And then she attached her own universal cuff to it. 
leg bag emptying, so um, basically a strap that allows you to uh, easily pull it off to empty it into the toilet. Uh, this item on the right, I think, is kind of clever. It's kind of a custom ring that someone made with a metal shaft that shadows the exact shape of the lever on the leg bag uh, in order to put that in between um, or behind the lever to flip it open in order to empty the leg bag. Some mechanical systems, um, a little more expensive. Um, I understand some people have had success getting these uh, reimbursed uh, as an incontinence supply. So a couple different options there, varying costs. Uh, uh, in terms of some of the catheters that are available now, there's uh, many that are out there that have really easy to use features. They're designed for people with limited hand function. Package is easy to opening, um, e easy to open. Um, they have a self-contained lubricant chamber and um, an advancer function to help advance the catheter. Um, again, bowel program, work with your rehab team to figure out what's gonna work uh, best for you if that's an area where you're wanting to get more independent. Couple of pictures of suppository inserters and, um, and digital stimulators. One just a traditional universal cuff and then one that was made by a, um, a set that was made by a therapist at Harborview, basically a, a palm based option made from splinting material. So moving on beyond some of the sort of basic day to day self care activities, uh, I'm gonna just touch quickly on, if I have time I think I do, uh, some other activities of daily living, so writing, having access to phone and computer, uh, cooking, laundry cleaning, um, kind of home, other home access, and then uh, briefly on recreation. So writing options, again, there's some nice commercially available products out there, uh, and then also some good sort of low cost, um, you know, homemade adaptations that can work well for people. And here's just a um, compilation of some different options. So the one on the left is a figure eight style splint that's made from a really small piece of splinting material and helps to get the fingers positioned uh, well for writing. And that seems to work well for lots of folks um, and is really kind of a nice low profile option. Uh, and then some commercially available products. Uh, and then I think uh, Aditya just showed me one that was um, pretty cool that I think he'll share at the end. Cooking and, and uh, kitchen activities. So this is something that I think oftentimes people don't feel like uh, they can be independent with. And I think it's, there's a lot of great options out there in terms of equipment and some really creative ideas for increasing independence in the kitchen. So I tried to compile some, uh, some ideas for this category. This uh, utensil here is called a quad knife and it's available from a company called Quad Tools. And this user uses it not only to open packages but also obviously to chop food. Uh, other people use other types of knives, one with an ergonomic handle. If you have a fairly good tenodesis grasp, that may work well for you. And then um, beyond knives, looking at um, simple equipment that might help to chop food. Uh, these also, I think, are pretty slick and something that I hadn't seen before, a slip-on style uh, peeler and um, vegetable brush. Uh, work surfaces, if you have a kitchen that's not accessible. Um, adapting a basic um, plastic utensil with rivets and splinting material, so kind of making your own universal cuff and you could do that with any piece of equipment in the, in the kitchen. A uh, couple of cutting boards, one with a hole that makes it easier to pick up and then a um, flexible one that which, which makes it easier to transfer food. Um, options for closing uh, food bags. Kitchen setup, um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide which shows a side opening uh, small uh, oven which I think is really nice and then a traditional oven on the left that has a key ring attached to the actual door that makes it easy to, to open. Uh, this is also kind of a nice item that maybe people may not have seen before. Um, on the left, it's basically an it's a piece of equipment that you can attach to a, a soda bottle and you know decant any liquid into it and allows for easier pouring, just slipping your hand up under there. Same idea with a plastic uh, measuring cup, liquid measuring cup. Moving on to laundry, uh, this I think is a nice setup. It's basically a washer and dryer that have been raised up and uh, open on opposite sides so the user doesn't have to go on both sides in order to do laundry. And then single use laundry detergent. A Couple of options for turning your machines on. Um, leather strap on the, on the door to be able to easy, more easily open the door. Cleaning, I think this is a pretty clever idea. This user basically made a kind of a stop out of uh, tape 
so it's kind of like a washer of tape around the center of the broom so that as he's using it, his hands don't slip up on the broom. Ho moving on to home access, so a couple of nice options uh, for more easily getting into the house. I think these are each um, between about $150 and $200. Uh, what I wanted to highlight in this slide is the item on the right. So there's some commercially available key holders that make it easier to turn a key in the lock. Um, but the user on the right basically just took an old credit card and duct taped it onto her key to make it larger for her to be able to more easily get in and out of her home without having to buy a key ring, opening and closing doors, uh, uh, phone holders. Um, briefly, I just want to say that uh, there are just a ton of new options for phone holders that are commercially available to people. I think people have done some really creative things just um, with low cost sorts of items, but some of the things that are out there now are so low cost, the ones that are commercially available. And there's so many different types that I would really encourage people just to go buy one. <laughs> um, so anyway, we have been using and having a lot of success with a local company called Ram, and they make all sorts of uh, phone holders for all sorts of different applications. Uh, using your phone, so whether it's a capacitive or a resistive type uh, screen, uh, a couple of different stylus options. One um, that we've been using a lot and have been liking is this one on the right. It's an um, a iFaraday stylus and it's bendable. So basically you bend it to, you, to your, uh, however you want to use it and however it works well on your hand. And then a traditional stylus inside a universal cuff. Even just using a simple finger splint. So basically using splinting material to get one finger out in an extended position in order to be able to access a touch screen. Uh, again, computer and tablet mounts, a lot of great options out there. I probably won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, I do like that product on the bottom, the Wally strap, I think is fairly clever and not one that I'd seen before. Uh, moving on to recreation, lots of options out there in terms of gloves that can hold different items depending on what it is that you want to be able to do. Uh, the Receive All, which is a great product for uh, fishing uh, gear and, and other things as well. Looks like the one on that left is more of a custom-made one. The user uh, that sent in these pictures, she made a um, splint. She made this. Uh, I don't know what you'd call it, almost like a pick for her auto harp. Um, and so one side helps her to pick the the strings, and then the other side helps her to depress the buttons. So with that, I think I'm going to pass it off to Leslie, who's going to talk to us about um, orthotics and splints for uh, patients with upper upper cervical spinal cord injuries. Okay, so I wanted to talk quickly tonight about some of the most common types of orthotics we use to improve hand function. So I'm going to start with talking about the most basic type of splint we use, and that's a resting hand orthotic. Typically, these are the first type of orthoses a person is given after a cervical spinal, spinal cord injury, and they're issued in the hospital and primarily used to minimize complications in case of any motor return. So the goal here is to protect the wrist and finger joints, prevent losing any range of motion, preserve the natural appearance of the hand by supporting the arches, and to prevent any skin breakdown. The resting hand orthotics hold the hand in what we call the functional or safe position. And that's where the wrist is pretty much straight to a little bit raised. So we call that neutral to 30 degrees of extension. The fingers are mostly straight, and the thumb is opposed to the fingers. And we try and keep adequate web space here, the space between the thumb and the fingers. So here the wrist is, is able to be held in this position for extended amounts of time without developing much stiffness. The wear schedule for these is about six to eight hours a night. Um, we check the skin daily to make sure there's no areas of irritation or developing pressure. And eventually people discontinue wearing these if they have any motor return or if their hands remain stable over time and they're not developing any stiffness um, and they have good range of motion, then people pretty much abandon them eventually. We custom fabricate them out of a thermoplastic in the hospital but they can also be purchased online as prefabricated orthotics. 
and it looks like they range anywhere from 80 to $135, and they have quite a bit of adjustability to, to sort of fit the need that you're looking for. Another basic type of splint that we use is called the wrist extension splint. This one provides stability and protection to the wrist joint for people with a C5 and above level of injury. So people with this level of injury typically don't have wrist strength. However, they do have the strength to bend at the elbow. So we'll com commonly com uh, combo this with a universal cuff so that people have more independence with upper body activities. So we'll commonly use it with a stylus to access touch touch screen devices. Um, and we also use it for self-care, for things like brushing teeth or eating. And then another frequently used type of splint is called a, north a thumb opponent splint. And this orthotic is used to improve the ability to pick objects up using tenodesis. And as most of you probably know, tenodesis is a way for people with a C6 or C7 level of injury to grasp objects without the use of finger function. So with tenodesis, by dropping your wrist down, your fingers move away from your palm. And when you move your wrist up, your fingers passively get closer to your thumb. Your thumb and your fingers come together. So with an optimal tenodesis grip, there would be enough passive range of motion or flexibility to get fingers around the desired object and then enough tendon tightness to close the fingers and grasp that object when you extend your wrist. So you can see here with the picture on the right, um, this individual does not have a lot of tightness when he raises his wrist. So the thumb and the fingers are not coming close together. So we'll typically use a thumb opponents to help bring the thumb closer to the fingers and make a stronger grip. And these splints are custom fabricated out of a lightweight thermoplastic, and they're typically fastened with Velcro. We use them a lot during training, so when people are learning to use tenodesis as a technique, it gives them enough strength to start to be successful with it. But typically people eventually abandon these as well, either because they've gotten strong enough that they don't need the splints anymore, or eventually they just don't want to bother with having to wear an orthotic every single day. I wanted to just touch briefly on something called a wrist-driven, wrist-hand orthotic, mainly because I get questions about them. Um, and this is a type of splint that mechanically forces the fingers and thumb together when you extend the wrist. The downside to these is that they're very difficult to get on and off by yourself. So um, you still end up needing the assist of another person typically to wear this. And they are quite costly. They range anywhere from six to $700. So now I'm gonna talk about something called tenodesis splinting. And the goal of this type of splinting is to enhance the natural grip strength when using tenodesis. We do this by intentionally tightening the tendons that flex the fingers when the wrist is extended. So we also intentionally shorten the tendons in the in the thumb so that it remains straight and close against the fingers. We only do tenodesis splinting with people who have complete injuries because we don't want to obstruct any potential return of finger function. We use two different splints, alternating them nightly, and we wear them until the desired grip is obtained. So this is the first type of splint that, that we put someone in, and it's called a flexion wrap and fingers are flexed into the fist position. The thumb is held straight against the fingers, and the wrist is positioned in about 45 degrees of extension, so, so quite a bit of extension at the wrist. So basically, you're held in that grasping position overnight. The second type of splint lengthens the fingers into extension, and it holds the wrist down in a flexed position, and once again, it keeps the thumb straight against the fingers because we really want to straighten that thumb so that um, it supports getting a stronger tenodesis grip. So the wear schedule for these are four to eight hours nightly. 
uh, they, you alternate the splints every other night and we're frequently or daily assessing the range of motion. We wanna make sure that we're not over tightening the finger flexors and that people aren't developing any stiffness in their hands. And um, yeah, we wanna make sure that we're reaching the goal of making the grip better. So I wanna show you a video of a patient who trialed tenodesis during his rehab stay. He was diagnosed with a C7 Asia A injury, and he was hesitant to trial the splinting regimen. Uh, his, his left wrist was stronger than his right after his injury, and he was concerned about losing that advantage or potentially interfering with um, his new ability to start to pick things up with tenodesis. So he was just learning this technique, and he was a little bit nervous about trialing the splinting that, that may not work. So eventually he was agreeable to doing it, but only with his right hand, which is what he considered to be his weaker hand. Um, he was also a guitar player and he was, he was really hoping for a return of finger function in his left hand. So we did the splinting trial with only his right hand. Okay, so here, this is his right hand. So this is before doing any splinting. This is his baseline. And you can see he's, he's struggling to get the peg out of there, but he does eventually get it out and he's able to transfer it over. And this, this is his left hand, what he considered to be his stronger hand. He's still struggling a little bit to have enough tension between his thumb and finger there, but he does get it out. And then this is after two weeks of the nightly splinting, alternating the splints. He also had some practice in there, so his technique is getting better, but he has a lot more tension between his thumb and his first finger. And then this is the left, and you can see he's still struggling to have a tighter grasp there between his thumb and finger. And here it's showing him pick up a soda can. His fingers easily, they're flexible enough to, to easily get around the soda can, but he does have enough tightness to pick the can up. And then with the left hand, he has great flexibility. He's able to get his fingers around the can, but he doesn't quite have enough tightness to grasp the can to pick it up off the table. This is just one more shot of him, how much stronger he got on the right side. So that's Tino just splinting. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Amy, who's gonna talk about exercise. Okay, so exercise. Pretty much what you already know about exercise is what the research tells you. Um, exercise creates increased strength and decreased pain. People in an exercise group reported less stress, depression, and increased quality of life, and the benefits for people with acute and chronic injuries were seen. So don't stop exercising. Um, there's a few exercise resources. We're not really going to go into exercise a lot tonight, but if you wanted to go get into more in-depth information, there are three forum videos online that you can watch. And then there's some cute community options that I just wanted to mention. There's a transition and wellness program at the University of Washington and Harborview Medical Center, and they offer an exercise group and yoga classes with Beth. And um, the YMCA also will... Um, has a sliding scale for people, so it, they'll work with you financially and they'll work on getting equipment if you have special needs for special equipment. And then if you want to exercise in the house because of transportation issues or you're just a little more comfortable in your home, there's a resource for a video. The next topic that we're going to get into is neuromuscular electrical stimulation. And basically what it is is a technique that we use to stimulate muscle activation. Um, typically, it's a device that can be a handheld device that works um, via electrodes on your skin. You put the electrodes on the muscle that you want to activate, you turn the device on, and then you get the electrical current to stimulate the muscle, and you can stimulate muscle movement. Basically, the two types of neuromuscular electrical stimulation that I'm going to touch on is um, you, the first one is used in more inpatient recent injuries, and then the, the second one is used as an assistive device typically later on um, in your recovery. Uh, so the, the 
electrical stimulation that we use in rehab is mainly to increase muscle strength and to facilitate movement. And then when you use it as an assistive device, you're wearing the device all the time to get the um, activity that you want to do. So for instance, one of the devices that's commercially available is the Bioness. Typically, this isn't covered by insurance, and it's fairly expensive. And we don't typically use this a lot for functional activity because it's large and cumbersome. And there is a piece that comes over onto your thumb. So if you go to pick up a glass, you can't, you can't really get it in your hand really well like it shows in the picture because of the, the thumb piece. So we use this more as a strengthening tool. But it's kind of exciting that they're doing a lot of research for this. They now have a wireless system, so the systems are improving. There's also a bionic glove. It's not commercially available, but it's also being researched. And then lastly, for um, neuromuscular stimulation, there's implantable devices. The freehand system was available up until 2001. It was actually implanted in about 250 individuals, and it produced good outcomes with opening and closing the hand. Um, unfortunately, the company is no longer making this device, but the good news is that there's a second generation device that is being researched at the FES Center in Cleveland, Ohio. So basically, this is an implantable device that, you can, that stimulates opening and closing your hand, so there's nothing that you have to wear on the skin. And then lastly, just to go over surgical interventions, the two surgical interventions that are available to people are tendon transfers and nerve transfers. Tendon transfer surgery is basically moving a tendon from an active muscle to an inactive muscle. The goal is to reproduce lost movement at a specific joint to increase independence. And the procedures focus on restoring elbow extension, wrist movement, and hand opening and closing. So an example of a tendon transfer would be moving a biceps tendon to the triceps tendon. So basically what that would do is the tendon that flexes your elbow is moved to the tendon that would extend your elbow. So it increases reach, increases independence with transfers because now you're able to extend your arms, and it enhances wheelchair propulsion. And a lot of people that have had the surgery before they weren't able to really straighten their arms at all, and after the surgery, they were able to straighten their arms against gravity. So that increases your reach tremendously. Typical candidates are C4 or lower, or C5 or lower injuries, neurologically stable, motivated, good health. Um, you can't have any contractures. You have to have good controlled spasticity and a good seating system so your trunk's stable. So when you do have that reach, you're, you have a stable base that you're reaching from. And you have to have realistic expectations. And again, the studies have shown that the patients experience functional gains long term. Um, nerve transfers aren't as common as tendon transfers. They're just starting to be done more frequently. Um, the good thing about the nerve transfers is there's less time that you have to be immobilized after surgery, and one nerve transfer can result in multiple functions gained. Um, the, the unfortunate thing about nerve transfers is nerves heal very slowly, so you might not see results in the desired movement for not up to 9 to 12 months. And then the barriers to the surgical interventions is there's not really a hand surgeon that works with our physiatrists in the area that consistently do the surgery. So I think now we're going to hear from our first panelist, Aditya. I think first we mentioned you, I could show a few things that I have on my chair. I have, I have lots of stuff. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I have lots of stuff, so I don't want to take up all day um, showing my, uh, my quad blowing off. But, um, uh, and this has kind of been the accumulation of years of tinkering. Uh, I should make a disclaimer, though. So I'm a pretty atypical SCI. Um, and I have a four or five level injury, but it's not really that like, uh, so I have uh, the finger of justice and the pinch of liberty. Um, that's what I call it. So I can pick things up and uh, do unquadly things. Um, actually, my friend uh, noticed that, uh, that I, I could pinch and zip, and he gave me the highest compliment. He's, oh man, you're barely a cripple. It's like, <laughs> you're too kind. But um, 
so maybe quickly clothing stuff um, would be zip tie and um, zipper pulls. Bungee cord is really great because it's elastic and you can use your teeth without um, breaking them. So you could zip all the way up without having good shoulder extension. Um, also helpful is having your your like good jacket, having um, a two-way zipper put in, because that way you don't have the belly, the quad belly on top of the quad belly. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the other uh, kind of vitals around um, securing my stuff, I used to use these little lanyards um, to hold my phone, um, you know, because they're real thin for USBs. And I would string it around a phone case. And then I thought, oh, it'd be great to hook the lanyards on to my seatbelt, which, which worked, except I had four things after a while. And four of these is eight strings. So it was a giant mess in here. Things would go each other. Yeah, it was, it was bad. So after a, a, friendly, a trip to the friendly REI, which is a big outdoor store, um, I started looking in, into what would be much more rad. Um, and climbing rope, uh, easily put into knots, can go around all sorts of things like keys, um, your wallet, so no one can jack you. Um, and also your phone, I mean your uh, water bottle, because that was the first thing I strapped up because I used to take the bus a lot and if I rode across the street and the bottle fell on the floor, I'd be an idiot sitting in the middle of the street um, waiting for someone to pick my bottle up. So um, those are like the basics of how I don't drop things. Um, I also have a hard time letting go, as you can see. Um, other little, oh, other basic safety stuff I have on my chair. Um, bicycle stuff works really well. So this is, a, this is overkill in terms of a light. Um, but you can get little ones that are made for helmets. And this one is called the Viz 360 by Light light in motion, I'm just getting this lateral around. Um, and it has one simple button right here that you, you don't need the finger of justice to, to press. You can just use your thumb and uh, it turns on in the front and it's pretty bright. But wait, wait, ah. <laughs> that way you don't get jackknifed in the back um, if you're riding on the street like a hooligan. Um, also, rear view mirror, bike stuff, uh, more bike stuff. That way you can check out who's on your tail in hot pursuit. Um, other little bike stuff, this little bag. Um, you can get a lot of bike stuff that'll work for you, like bottle holders and um, Camelback. That's kind of a bike thing. Um, should we talk about some of this other stuff? Um, so carabiners are these guys, and they're used in rock climbing, but they're also used for securing non-essential goods like all of my stuff. All of these things are on one carabiner, which um, I don't know if the video can see, but it's on my belt here. So then when I get home, I can kind of hook around and um, take the carabiner off and then drop my stuff so I don't have to um, carry all this stuff around or accidentally open my car door when I lean down on it. Not okay. Um, this is a splint. Um, it was made by Onorth, uh, Prosthetis, Onorthotist. It's called a short opponent's hand splint. Um, basically, my fingers are, my right hand is more like a C6-ish hand it's, it's, got, it's got a lot of stuff going on, mostly tone. So it'll take me a while to put this on. But essentially, uh, maybe Amy can demonstrate. Um, you put it, you slip it on like that. 
and you don't need fi finger function. Um, I have wrist extension, but it kind of just stays that way. You could easily get a longer splint um, that will go around your uh, forearm, and so you'll be able to write. Or you could have other things um, implanted onto it. Uh, this had a piece of copper tubing, um, so that was opened up and riveted onto it by a prosthetist so that a pen could fit through it. Um, okay. Yeah, no problem. Should I? Well, I can follow up on kitchen stuff after. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Great. I think we'll do a little switcheroo. Come All right. Good evening. Um, as some of the things that were demonstrated, I have some similar adaptations to handle everyday life, um, and some of them are attached to my chair here. Uh, as was mentioned, camelbacks have great water bottles with you know, the ability to pick them up if you've got at least a finger or thumb that you can stick out and uh, standard bicycle grips to uh, be able to put those into. And zip ties are wonderful. You can just attach everything with those, um, particularly if you've got somebody who can help you with that. Um, this bag that I use actually was just a purse that had the strap removed and it's attached by zip ties to the uh, side of my chair. Um, similar injury level, um, I had a C6, C7 injury. Um, however, I'm fortunate enough to have some finger function and uh, fairly recent injury, so we'll see how much more we get. Um, but with all of that, still wanted to have some of the uh, same basic capabilities. Touch screens are wonderful um, from the standpoint of you know being able to interact with the computer. Um, I do have one of the uh, stylus that was mentioned before and we just bent it around to a way that it would essentially create a uh, individual finger that I could use to touch the touch screen. Um, that works really nicely with an iPad or one of the other touchscreen tablet devices. Um, I've also found now, though, that my fingers are straight enough that um, I can use the finger alone to kind of do one, one key typing. And then, of course, we can all work with the uh, voice-activated software. Um, and uh, I've found that uh, one of the best features of that is the question, what can I say? so that the software explains a little bit to you of you know, what commands are available in the different uh, applications that you're working in. I've done a couple of other minor things here to uh, be able to work with, with my equipment. I actually have a couple of different phones. Uh, this one is just tied to um, a little holder on the side of the case, and it's just a piece of ribbon so that I have something I can grab onto. I don't have enough grip with my fingers to be able to just grab it in a grasp and lift it up, but this at least gets it there for me. Um, and then depending on the position I want to have it in, I can use that loop on any finger and you know kind of tip it in different directions. If the phone you have doesn't have a case that has that, um, you can work with the, the wonders of duct tape, and this one just has duct tape to the back of it. Uh, so again, you could put a zip tie or a piece of ribbon or string or any of those types of things around it. Again, just to give you a way to lift it up and uh, then work with it. Love the ideas of actually attaching it to you so you can't throw it on the floor, which I have done many times. And although I have retrievers, all that they like to do is chew on my equipment rather than pick it up for me. <laughs> um, some of the other things that I've used are um, you know, various ways to hold on to a pen, but one thing I've found, even if you have really limited function, is that just between two hands, it didn't take me too long to kind of figure out how to write with both hands. Um, and so if I don't have uh, you know, a splint device with me or any of the things that I use, that's kind of a fallback that I can work through. Um, I think uh, probably the other biggest thing is just to keep looking for ideas from everyone that you run into. And uh, every time I have encountered somebody, we've picked up a few of the tips and, and tricks that they've used and tried to incorporate those. <laughs>